Hi everyone, welcome to Music 16. Uh, this video, which I'm going to try to keep short, but there's a lot of information to cover, is essentially a crash course to basic musical terminology for those of you who are non-musicians in preparation for our listening to jazz class. So there's lots of terminology, lots of insider musical information that is often thrown around, especially in talking about or um, kind of uh, analyzing and reading about the history of jazz. So this video is hopefully a primer for you to kind of um, catch up, so to speak, on you know the decades and decades of, of lingo that we have. So um, we're going to do this in four parts. Uh, feel free to skip around. I'm going to try to put time codes in the description for you so you can refer back to this later. We're going to start off by talking about the instruments of a jazz ensemble, their names, their types, what they look like, etc. Types of jazz ensembles, which of which there are basically two categories. Key definitions of music, both of music in general, but also of jazz specifically. And then we're going to end with actually a little brief intro into how to really listen to music and to jazz specifically. So I recommend taking notes for later reference for this, but of course, feel free to refer back to this video or email me if you have any questions throughout the quarter. So let's start off with jazz instruments, okay? Um, as we'll see, what can count as a jazz instrument is actually somewhat fluid um, and actually can encompass a wide variety of things, but there are certain standards at play in terms of what we expect to see in a jazz ensemble. So let's start off with what we call the horns. Um, we refer to horns as any instrument that is activated by, you know, blowing through it. So for instance, the first group of horns we have is the saxophone family. So saxophones are what a lot of people think of when they think of jazz is usually saxophone is one of those first instruments. Um, there's different varieties of saxophone. So you'll see all different types at play throughout the quarter and um, it, for different reasons. So the most common is probably the tenor saxophone, which is this one right here, the second from the right. But you'd see soprano, the small one, alto, tenor, and barry, baritone, barry saxophone, um, all with relative frequency. You have a full section of these with two altos, two tenors, and a barry in a big band, um, which we'll talk about what a big band is in a second. So uh, any of them are possible in a combo setting, even though the tenor is probably the most common. Okay, so saxophones. Of course, we have the trumpet. So uh, many people think of Louis Armstrong as a go-to musician when they think of jazz, and the trumpet is, of course, his instrument. So it's the highest pitched instrument in the ensemble. It plays the highest notes, and there are typically four of them in a big band. Um, unlike the other instruments we'll see, they don't really come in other varieties. Um, there are some exceptions, but trumpets are generally just trumpets. And then finally, our last horn, our last wind instrument is the trombone. Uh, now, there are two types of this. Uh, there's the tenor trombone, which you see here on the right, and the bass trombone, which you see here on the bottom. There's very subtle differences between the two. You really only ever see tenor trombone as an improvising instrument, uh, but you do have a bass trombone in a big band. The difference is, is notice that there's more tubing and the bell is bigger, which in this picture is hard to tell the difference, but you typically have three trombones and a bass trombone in a big band. Okay, So those are all the horns, instruments that we're probably familiar with. The rhythm section is instruments that kind of play a more of a background role and don't involve any sort of playing, like blowing into. So piano, of course, uh, there's Count Basie at the piano. Uh, we'll talk about different types of pianos, but you know, grand piano is typically a common thing to see for big band or for combo playing. Guitar, uh, there's West Montgomery in the top corner there. Guitars typically in jazz play uh, electric, but with a clean sound. So there's usually no distortion, not really any pedal work, but you don't really see acoustic guitars, usually clean, electric, hollow body like you see there with Wes. Vibraphone, also called Vibes. There's Milt Jackson on the right there. Uh, the vibraphone looks somewhat like a xylophone, but they are completely different instruments. Vibraphones have a metallic sound to them and uh, tubing at the bottom that allows them to reverberate or vibrate, hence vibraphone. Um, and you actually see them with relative frequency in jazz environments. The bass which is usually plucked, but rarely and occasionally bowed, like you would have a normal bass. Not a cello. This is a huge difference. A cello was a smaller instrument and a classical instrument. The bass in the jazz context is upright, is much bigger, and is usually plucked. Um, like I said, it's rare to see it bowed, but it does happen sometimes. And then finally, the drum set. Um, so, you know, snare drum, cymbals, toms, bass drums, lots and lots of variety in what can go into a jazz drum set, but that's kind of your basic especially cymbals and snare, uh, played with sticks or with brushes. And these are like metallic brushes that give kind of like a ch -ch 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 kind of sound. Um, you usually need bass and drums in a rhythm section as a bare minimum. 
Uh, what that third instrument is is optional, and you could hypothetically have all five of these different types of instruments. So um, as we'll see, what types of instruments are in a jazz ensemble can be quite fluid, um, but uh, usually bass and drums are a must. So other instruments. You may be thinking of other instruments in your head that you've heard of in a jazz context before. Voice, of course. So jazz vocalists are another big part of the idiom. Flutes. Uh, both as a serious instrument and also as a source of memes, if you've ever seen Anchorman before. Jazz flute is actually a relatively common thing, um, and uh, as well as clarinet. Two other wind instruments, horns, um, oftentimes you'll see these doubled by saxophone players in a big band. So they'll put the saxophone down, they'll take out a flute or a clarinet and play a passage. Banjo, which happens in way older jazz, but it does happen, and we may, we may see some of this. So there's a picture at the bottom there. You can see the banjo there on the right. This predated the guitar as a jazz instrument. Latin and African percussion. So uh, Latin jazz um, is, is, is a big kind of uh, related field of jazz, and you get lots and lots of um, Afro-Cuban, Latin American, African percussion. Uh, there's Tito Puente there. Uh, and then, of course, organ, electric piano, synthesizers. So there's Herbie Hancock there with his ring. You've got synthesizers, electric pianos, Hammond organs. All are possibilities as a substitution for piano. Um, but basically, anything you can think of can count as a jazz, uh, as a jazz instrument. So um, if you look hard enough, you can find basically anything being used in a jazz setting. So that takes us through the basics, what the instruments are. This may be reviewed for many of you. Um, but that's what all the different types of instruments are called that you see. Now, how are those instruments arranged? Well, they're arranged into ensembles, of which we have basically two types. Um, we have a big band. Obviously, it's bigger. Usually you have 13 horns, five saxes, four trombones, and four trumpets, plus a rhythm section, which is usually piano, guitar, bass, and drums. The big band plays what we call arranged music. All the parts are written out, but often memorized. Um, except for solo sections where one person solos and everybody else plays background. So as you see here in the Vanguard picture, we've got one person soloing and everybody else is playing background figures. And you can see the stands here with their music and the music on the piano. Now, you'll see this relatively frequently that a big band will be called an orchestra. This is an older convention. So like the, the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. Don't be confused. It's not an orchestra. There's no strings. There's no conductor. It's not a symphony. Um... It's just called an orchestra for the, the size purposes. Now, this is a bit of an older style of playing jazz, is the big band, um, more prominent in the swing era in the 30s and 40s, but we still have big bands today, of course, and a lot of American high schools uh, usually have big bands as their jazz department. However, what is probably more common in general for jazz is what we call a combo. So these are smaller and have variable sizes, which could range from two to 10 plus people. So basically, um, almost all the way up to the size of a big band again, or down to just two people as a combo. Usually you have some kind of rhythm section, um, typically piano, drums, and bass. That could be the whole combo. It's called a piano trio. Piano, drums, bass, that could be it. That's all that you might need. But oftentimes you do see um, expansions of that. You could swap out piano for another rhythm section instrument, or there's even cases where you have quartets where there's no piano, just drums and bass. So lots and lots of options. There's nothing really set in stone with what a combo should be. Now, um, combo music is more freely improvised. Everyone reads from a lead sheet, which we'll talk about later, but most of the music, I would surmise 80%, if not more, is improvised on the spot. Uh, big bands have a little room for improvisation, but it's more written out. Um, so you can see the Dave Holland Quintet on the right there. We've got uh, tenor sax, trombone, vibraphone, bass, and drums. Okay. Um, now, even though that the big band is more written and the combo is more improvised, in general, jazz as an idiom is an improvisational medium. Okay, So improvisation is the core of the jazz experience no matter what, you know, no, no matter what style or format it's a part of. So let's talk about hearing the difference. Okay, We're going to listen to two quick tracks here. So in a big band, the horns typically play with their sections. So saxophones will play as a section. Trombones will play as a section. Trumpets will play as a section. This is not a rule, but this is more of a, a theme you see. So oftentimes you'll see all the horns playing at the same time, but playing in different kind of different kind of figures based on whether they're trumpets, saxophones, or um, uh, trombones. Now the rhythm section supports underneath. So if you have piano, guitar, 
uh, drums, bass, they're all continuing the, the pushing the music forward, but underneath what the horns are doing. And if there's a soloist, the soloist is rising above all of that. Okay. So this is a bit of an older style in the video we're about to watch, but big bands have largely remained unchanged for 80 years. Okay. Once we figured out what a big band was, which was uh, a, a saxophone section, a trombone section, a trumpet section, and a rhythm section. Once we figured that out, it's been largely unchanged. Unlike combos, which as I've mentioned, are a little bit more flexible in their instrumentation. So they're still soloing, but it's much less of a factor in the overall tune than the combos. And in fact, in this clip, it's, a, it's edited down, um, there's actually no soloing at all. So we're gonna watch a clip, but the camera, luckily, it pans over the different sections. So you can kind of see the whole group, you can see the trumpets, see the trombones, and then finally see the saxophone. So this is a very famous tune called Take the A-Train by Duke Ellington um, and his orchestra. So this is a recording from 1964. This is Take the A-Train. Yeah, so we started off by seeing the rhythm section. We then pan over the trumpet section, then the trombones and the saxophones. Now, something that I would recommend doing is as we, you get more comfortable, if you want to revisit this and revisit that clip, um, try to hear the differences between what the trumpets are doing, the trombones are doing, and the saxes are doing. Because in that case, it's pretty clear the separation between the sections and the material. Okay. Now, the other side of jazz, of course, is combos, which, as I've mentioned, is arguably more common. Uh, in fact, I would say inarguably more common. So the horns still work together, but you have all different types. So instead of thinking of things as the saxophone section, the trombone section, all the horns are together, all the rhythm section is together, and as an ensemble, they're all contributing to the music. It's a little bit less segmented, um, and usually you have different types of horns. So for instance, if you have a sextet, six people, you may have piano, drums, bass, saxophone, trumpet, trombone. So the three horns may be playing together, and then the rhythm section is playing together, but they're interacting with each other through music. So everyone has a piece of sheet music, usually a lead sheet, which we'll talk about a little bit later, as I mentioned, but the music isn't written out in the same way. Um, usually you play through what's on the lead sheet and then improvise for the rest of the tune, essentially. So it's a much heavier emphasis on improvisation than we see with big bands. Um, so this recording here is Chick Corea, Kenny Garrett, Christian McBride, and Roy Haynes in a 2010 concert uh, playing a tune called Steps. So this is a much newer uh, piece than what we just listened to with uh, Ellington, but this is kind of more of a more of what you see these days, especially as far as combo playing goes. So notice how there's no music there at all um, in terms of like written out. So they're all just playing from memory. They're listening to each other, communicating through their music. Um, and we see the end of a piano solo, a transition that has obviously been planned ahead of time in the middle there. And then the saxophone solo comes in and then begins. And um, this is a pretty standard thing that you see happen. Um, you know, one solo, maybe a transition material, and then another solo. So um, it's much looser, it's much freer. And again, there's a heavier emphasis on improvisation. Um, 
these aren't really different. And you can find big bands that are more improvisatory and combos that are more arranged. Um, they're just kind of two sides of the same coin. It's all equally jazz, just different kind of levels of organization. And that's for different historical reasons that we'll get into in the quarter. So let's pivot now to some key definitions to consider. So we're going to start off with some general musical definitions that is pertains to any Western art music or just Western music in general, even. Um, and then we're going to turn over to some jazz specific definitions for you. So general music terms, let's start off melody. Okay. Melody should be straightforward. Hopefully we've all heard of what a melody is. It's a series of notes that are written down. Okay. Um, jazz music is improvised. So the melody is the part that is written down when they play. If they are improvising, that is not playing the melody, for instance. That's an important difference for jazz. Melody is what is written down on the page, okay? Now, a chord is when you have multiple notes stacked on top of each other. So a note could be bomb. A chord is if you do bomb, bomb, and play that at the same time, for instance, okay? That is a chord. This is slightly different it's related to, but different than what we think of as harmony. So we've heard of this term harmony, I'm sure, before. Harmony is, in the case of music, but especially in the case of jazz, an underlying movement of chords that are written down. Okay. So for instance, harmony is something that everybody is on the same page about. They're thinking through in their head, and as they're playing, they are playing melody, they are improvising passages, or playing chords that fit above the harmony. However, a piano player playing a chord is not the same as playing the harmonies because harmony is something that everybody contributes to versus chord is something that usually pianists and guitarists and vibraphone players play. Now, if you're confused, the, the differences in this will become more kind of nuanced as we go through this. And this is kind of a complicated thing for a non-musician to usually understand because we're talking about similar things. Harmony is a series of chords, and a chord is just three notes on top of each other. But that doesn't mean that when a piano player is improvising and playing a bunch of different chords that they are playing the harmony. Because the harmony is something that is written down that everyone in the ensemble is on the same page about. They are playing chords. When a saxophone player is improvising, a saxophone player is playing over the, the harmony, for instance. So, again... If this is confusing, feel free to reach out to me. But as we go through this, the, this subtle difference will become clear. Um, and the reason why I mention this is because that if you say playing the harmony, that's more vague for a musician, for a jazz musician, than saying they're improvising a series of chords, for instance. So rhythm. Rhythm is, I'm sure, a familiar concept. Rhythm is simply how notes are articulated in time. Okay? So bum, 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 bum. That's all rhythm. I'm, I'm hitting a pulse with my hand and I'm singing a rhythm. Okay. This is different than meter because meter is the pulse. When we think of pulse or we think of beat, that is what jazz musicians and musicians refer to as meter. So if I'm doing this, this is the meter. This is the pulse. This is the beat. I'm hitting my hands in the meter and I'm singing the rhythm. Okay. Meter means something to musicians in terms of how it's written down and how it's organized. But for us, for listening and for writing's purposes, meter is thought of as like the pulse, the underlying thing. Rhythm is what happens on top of it. This is not unlike chord and harmony, where meter and harmony are underlying things that everybody's in agreement on that has been written down. But rhythm and chord are variable in terms of what happens on top, okay, for instance. Measure. So a measure is one unit of the meter, but within that measure, it contains all the chords, rhythms, melody, whatever that, that happens there. So measure, for instance, if, we, if we're thinking of things in groups of four, which is the most common way to think of a measure, four pulses, one, two, three, four, that is a measure. And what happens in that measure is all the musical material. It's just a way of organizing time into manageable chunks. Um, and as we listen to more and more jazz, you'll be able to hear the measures more clearly. Um, because the, the way that the drummer and the bassist articulate certain musical gestures gives you a clue to the measure, as well as to what we call the phrase, which is a grouping of measures. So usually two, four, or eight. So for instance, if we're thinking of beats, we may have four beats in a measure, and we may have four measures in a phrase. So that means every 16 bars, 
can be thought of as a larger unit of musical space. If you're not with me, don't worry. We'll see some examples of this as we progress. Okay. And then finally, the, the biggest overarching theme is what we call the form. Form is the overall structure of the piece. It's how phrases relate to each other, but it also has to do with the underlying written down harmony, meter, and melody. All the written down components of a piece contribute to its form. For instance, if we have an eight measure phrase that's one melody, and then an eight measure phrase that's a different melody, and both phrases are eight measures, we can think of the piece as being 16 bars that has an AB form. If we double that, it could be a 32 bar piece that has an AB, AB form. Uh, and just so you also know, bar, saying bar is just another way of saying measure. So measure and bar are used interchangeably. Um, that's just for convention's sake. There's no difference in meaning there, okay? So let's look at some examples. Now this is taken from notation, however, you don't need to know notation for this class, but this is how these concepts are transmitted to, music, to musicians. So I'm gonna show you what a jazz musician on the stand would see, okay? And you can kind of use just the visual clues in my explanations to kind of guide you into what that means, even if you can't necessarily read what the notation is doing. For instance, melody. Melody is a line. It is written on page. Here it is. We have a note that we hold for a while, we have three notes that we play, we have two notes that we play, and then hold that note for a while, okay? Um, the vertical axis is height and pitch, and the horizontal axis is time. Bum, 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 ba, um, all that this is, is this is a written out melody. An exceptionally common thing to see in big band charts or in combo charts. Now, harmony. This is the underlying harmony, okay? It's in a box, see? Notice that we've got these symbols written down, you see letters and symbols and numbers. These are chord changes, but don't get confused that they're called chord changes. This is the written down harmony that the piece happens on top of. Now notice that we have these written down symbols, but then we have these notes written on the staff here. Now, um, these are the chords and this is the harmony, okay? They are in alignment here, Okay, but notice that chords have aspects of rhythm. Chords could have different pitches. Chords could have added pitches, coloristic pitches, decisions that are made on the spot. So the harmony is what is written down. The chords are what is played in that moment. Now, rhythm. Rhythm is, as I mentioned before, rhythm is a just a series of notes as they occur. So in this case, we have bump, 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 bump. Okay, now. The rhythm is not the same as the meter, because as we said, the meter is like the pulse underneath. So if this is our meter, also sometimes called the tempo, there are differences between meter and tempo for musicians, of course, but for our purposes, we can think of meter and tempo as being somewhat synonymous as a non-musician. So we have this regular pulse, and above that we have a rhythm, and so on, okay? Um, form. Now, this is a very tiny picture of a lead sheet. We'll actually see this in the same lead sheet later, so don't you worry. This is just a way of showing this is the entire piece on a lead sheet. Um, musicians will repeat this over and over and over again and improvise and change different things, but this is what people can look at to get the gist. We've got four sections, four phrases, arranged into 32 bars or measures, and the third of those phrases is different. So we can think of them as AA, BA. This is an extremely common form for jazz tunes. We will see this form a lot. All that this means is we have four phrases and the third of those phrases is different. That's all that that means. Measure, of course, we have here. Notice that measures are marked for visually with these lines, these vertical lines. Measure is just a unit of time, okay? Within a sequence of notes and rhythms. Phrase is a larger unit. So notice that we have eight measures here to constitute one phrase of music. This phrase here that I have is the B section of this particular tune, okay? So you may still be a little bit confused and that's totally okay because there's a lot of the information all at once here. And this isn't about reading notation, it's about the concept. So um, this is a graph that is in no means comprehensive and is no means the only way this is one way to show how interconnected these concepts are. So rhythm is uh, related to meter, but also 
uh, related to the number of beats in a measure. In fact, meter could probably have a line over here too. Measures are organized into phrase. Phrases are organized into form. The way you identify a phrase could be through its melody. Melody is often built or constructed by working with harmony or coloring it with chords. Chords come from the harmony, and the harmony is another way that we could determine aspects of the form. Now, a lot of this stuff is relatively high level from a listening and from a comprehensive perspective. So that's, again, totally okay if you're not going to be, you know, there with us. But um, all of these concepts are related, and we will be discussing them in musical terms throughout the course. So we'll get more and more familiarity with this, but this is kind of just an overview of the basics of music. Now, there's more, though. Because now we have jazz-specific terms. So, some jazz-specific terms are lead sheet. I've mentioned lead sheet before. This here is the lead sheet. This is the whole thing. A lead sheet is simply a piece of sheet music that everybody reads off of. So, this would be played for a combo. Um, big bands play more kind of traditional-looking music, as if you were in, say, like a wind ensemble or an orchestra. There are moments where improvisation, the space for improvisation is written in. But usually it's more... You, play the, you start at the beginning, play to the end, and then the piece is over. A lead sheet is repeated over and over and over again. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Lead sheets don't specify written up parts in the same way. So you have the melody, you have the harmony, okay? Chordal embellishments, chord embellishments that you play, other uh, lines that you may play to kind of counteract the harmony, the, pardon me, the melody to make things more interesting, um, those are things that you can do but are not specified. That's what gives jazz some of its freedom is the kind of the, the, the looseness of what you can do on top of the melody and the chord changes, which is all you have here. Melody, harmony. That's all that's on a lead sheet. Now, a fake book, you'll hear this term. A fake book is just a term that we use to describe a compendium of lead sheets. For instance, I have a fake book right here. Okay. It is just a book of lead sheets. Okay. That's all that that is. Changes. Jazz musicians refer to changes as kind of a synonym for harmony. The changes persist and repeat the entire tune. When we play this measure, it is always a C chord. When we play this measure, it is always an F chord, and so on. This word comes from the this word comes from chord changes, but remember that harmony and chords are related but a little bit different. Okay, so I've highlighted here in blue, these are all of the, the chords. They happen above the music, and they are fixed in time. Now, we refer to a chorus as one time through the form of the lead sheet. So the form of, the, of this is A-A-B-A. -A -A. Okay, we've got a little repeat sign here. That's not important to know about, but take my word for it. We've got four phrases here that form an A-A-B-A -A -A form, and this will repeat. When we start at the top, we play to here, we go to the top again, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, giving everybody, everybody turns to solo until the piece is over. So, musicians repeat from the lead sheet from beginning to end, and a chorus is one time through that. In a, in a piece, in a performance, you may repeat this 15, 20 times, right? Um, what happens is, is sometimes you're playing the melody, sometimes you're improvising a solo, sometimes other things are happening. That's up to the musicians to do. So a chorus is kind of a way to organize sound in a way that's bigger than phrases, for instance. So one time through the form is a chorus. And then finally, we have a term that we call the bridge. You will, you will see this with relative frequency. For jazz musicians, the bridge refers to the B section, if there is one. Okay. In this tune, we have an A-A-B-A -A -A tune. The B section is referred to as the bridge. That's basically it. If, if ever if somebody talks about the bridge, um, whether you're reading, whether John talks about the bridge, the bridge is just a contrasting phrase within the overall form, usually in an AABA -A tune. Now, some other jazz specific terms, okay? Uh, these are not so much tied to um, the, the kind of the, the notation as the other things are. So we have what we call the head. So when you play the lead sheet as written with the written up melody and chord changes, this is called playing the head. So at the beginning of the tune, this is almost a default. You begin by playing what we call the in head, which is um, just reading, the, the, the reading through the sheet. After that, you improvise. So after the beginning of the in head, uh, the melody is no longer played and improvisation happens. 
with the changes, okay? Repeating choruses happen. And then at the very end of the tune, when everybody's done and they're planning to conclude and go to the end, uh, tunes usually end by playing the head again. We call this the outhead. So we have the inhead and the outhead, which is just a, a fancy way of saying we play the melody at the beginning of the tune and at the end of the tune. And what the middle is, is all improvisation. Okay. You may hear, hear this term called lick. Lick is just a brief passage of music that can be learned or repeated by other musicians. Here is a written out lick. This could come from somebody else's solo. This could be something that you write out and plan ahead of time. Licks are just little musical, um, they're like melodies almost, but they're not written out. They're instead thought of as little tools, building blocks of improvisation, so to speak. So you're not gonna have to know licks, but you may hear this term come up and it's just referring to little segments of music that people like to play in their improvised passages. Blow is a term for, it's just another word for improvising. So something you may hear on a bandstand or may read about in a book is somebody saying, who's blowing on this tune? That just means who is going to be taking a solo. Chops is the word for technical ability. So um, for instance, you know, you could say that she's got great guitar chops. She's really shredding on her guitar. She's really playing with a high level of technique and a high level of skill, okay? Wood shedding, sometimes just called shedding, is just another word for practicing, as in I'm gonna go out to the woodshed with my horn and figure this out, okay? Think of just like a place to go where you're just gonna practice. That's what's called wood shedding. And then finally, comping. Comping is a term for when the rhythm section plays backgrounds for a soloist, okay? So you will hear drums, bass, and piano play as a saxophone player is improvising, for instance. If the, what the piano player is playing is considered comping. It's like improvising, okay, because it's all improvised material, but instead of being a solo, taking the lead, comping is improvising, but in the background to support the soloist, okay? What the heck does all of this mean, though, okay? So we've talked about a lot of different terms, musical terms, jazz terms, instruments, ensembles, lots and lots of material. How do we really listen, okay? This is what this whole course is really about. Okay, the whole course is going to be about getting your listening abilities up. But let's just do a little bit of practice of things that we'll see to come. How do you apply all of this material? So say you have no musical experience at all, which you would be the target audience for this video. All of these terms and concepts are not merely written down, but they're also heard. So, you know, musicians figure out what the form of the tune is. They figure out the changes, measures, meter. These are all things that are written down, but they're just ways to represent the sound that is happening. So that's why you don't need to know how to read music, to know how to appreciate music, write about music, listen critically to music. So think of these concepts and try to apply them to your listening. This is easier said than done. It will take all quarter to do this and it requires practice. But for example, start off by trying to listen to the instruments and separating them in your mind. See what they're doing differently. On one listen through, listen to just the bass and see what the bass is doing. On another listen through, listen to just the piano and see what the piano is doing, etc. Or you could try to differentiate when they're playing the head or when they're soloing. So when does it sound like everybody's reading from a piece of music? And when does it sound like they're improvising? Um, this may seem difficult or random at first, but once you get more experience with jazz, it's actually pretty obvious to tell when somebody's going off the cuff and improvising and when everybody's playing from a piece of music. So jazz, like most music, begs active listening. So you need to listen, not merely hear, okay? So listen with quality over ear headphones. Um, what I have right now, just for my own reference, um, is not good enough. You wanna have a nice pair that go over. I've got a Sony set over there. Um, quality over ear headphones that allow you to hear the bass and hear the richness of the sound. It'll also make it easier to differentiate parts of the music that we've been talking about. And finally, listen to the same track many times and listen to jazz often. Um, it has never in history been easier to listen to music as it is right now. Spotify, streaming services, YouTube, um, all easy ways to listen to recorded music, okay? Um, so try to make jazz, at least for this quarter, for the sake of this class, a part of your daily routine. Try to listen to one track a day, one album a week, something like that. Find a track that you like and listen to it a couple times and try to unravel what's going on in it, okay? For instance, let's do practice, okay? So this is the tune Lady Bird uh, with Dexter Gordon on tenor sax, George Gruntz, Guy Peterson, and Daniel Humer. 
Okay. So we're going to listen to this. It is a five minute long track. Okay. So feel free to revisit this, pause this, uh, whatever you need to do. But here's some things to listen for, for instance. When does the in head end? When does the solo section start, essentially? When is the music transitioning from written to improvised? Can you tell what one chorus is? As a hint, when you're working with video, um, choruses are usually the same length because, again, it's the form. It's written down. It's 32 measures is the form of whatever, okay? Um, that means that if you figure out how long that is, say, 30 seconds, you could probably go every 30 seconds and identify where all the choruses are. So that's a strategy going forward. What solos happen and in what order? Does the tenor sax solo? Does the piano solo? Who's soloing? Can you hear each instrument? Bass is famously hard to hear, especially if you don't have good headphones. But what are they doing? What is the role that each instrument fulfills? Um, can you identify the melody? How would you describe the solos in terms of energy, in terms of density? You can use terms that are not musical to describe music. So you can say, he's playing with a high level of energy. It sounds very frenetic. It sounds very chill. It sounds very uh, suspicious. You, you, there's ways to describe music in a way that is not just, he's playing these notes here. Uh, and then what parts stick out to you? What parts do you like? What parts do you don't like? What parts resonate with you, etc.? All of these questions and more is what this course is all about. So we're going to answer these throughout. So if you want to revisit this later in the quarter, I'd recommend it. But in any case, especially if you're just studying out, I would recommend taking notes throughout this process, just jotting down little things. Um, as always, these questions get easier the more you've listened to jazz and the more you've heard the specific track. If this is the first time you've ever heard jazz before, this is going to seem somewhat odd. Okay? It's going to be a lot of information. But the more you get with it, the more familiar it becomes, the easier it will be for you. Okay, so we're going to listen to this entire track. It's five minutes. We'll listen through it once. Feel free to revisit it later if you want. Um, this is Dexter Gordon playing Lady Bird.
Okay, that's a whole jazz chart from beginning to end. Okay, so here's an example of the types of notes you can take. Now, this is not in depth at all. Um, some of this is even arguable, it's more subjective. Um, this is not exhaustive. There's an infinite number of things you could say. So here's some brief observations. Um, it's a mixture of more objective things like time codes and the number of choruses and more subjective things. So for instance, um, this is the kind of thing that you would not get on one listen alone. Uh, it would take many, many listens to get to this point. So don't worry. Um, but after I talk through this, feel free to go back and listen to it again and see what you think. So the first in head is it's 16 measures long. It's the first 20 seconds of the piece. They repeat the whole in head again. It's relatively short, so they do it twice. We have a tenor sax solo, nine choruses. Energy is generally consistent, but I do think that there is a pretty, there's a slight but energetic build to the end. It's generally all kind of in the middle. It doesn't really go down. It just kind of goes a little bit up. Um, the tenor sax rises in range throughout, so they play higher notes as the piece goes, goes on. And the piano plays an active comping role. There's a lot of piano happening under tenor sax. This is not always the case, so you can mention that. Uh, after the tenor sax, there's a piano solo, which is three choruses. The piano rises intensity throughout and eventually plays more complicated left-hand comping as the solo progresses. The piano player can comp for themselves. The left hand can do chords and different kind of improvisational embellishments as the right hand plays an improvised passage. There's a drum solo, uh, which is only two choruses. Uh, here's another term that we didn't talk about that's more of a jazz kind of idiomatic thing. The sax, bass, and piano trade eights with drums, which is where the whole band plays the first eight measures of the chorus. Then the drums play the other eight measures. So they alternate back and forth to give the drummer some time to shine um, at the end. And then finally, the out head is two more choruses. They play what's called a tag at the end, followed by what's called a fermata. So one is a jazz-specific term, tag. One is fermata, a music, uh, music general term. Tag is just extra material added to the end just to energize the ending. And uh, a fermata is just a long pause, usually at the end, embellished with cymbal strikes, with horn improvisation. Um, it's, it's what the end of the tune happens when they hold a note, so to speak. This is not a ton of observations, but at the same time, some of this is relatively high level. It's kind of a mix here. So notice that you can use time codes to orient yourself. A chorus is about uh, 20 seconds. So you could think of things in 20 second chunks throughout the entire piece. You've got objective information, piano solo, three choruses, followed by subjective information, rises in intensity, and things that are kind of a mixture, okay? So as we go through the quarter, we'll be able to do things like this. So if you're not there yet, that's totally fine. This is where we're going. So feel free to revisit this as we proceed throughout the course, okay? So this is basically it. Um, this is a primer of the type of material we'll get through the entire quarter. We'll be doing lots of listening. We'll spend a lot of time talking about history, talking a lot about the music, the listening process, the types of pieces, etc. So feel free to refer back to this video throughout if you'd like, or email me if you have any questions. And this is my email right here, tccassidy at ucsb.edu. So um, this is an ever-evolving process, so listen often and listen carefully. As I said, try to listen to a jazz tune a day, an album a week. Um, actually listen to it. The more you listen to it, the easier it will get and the easier this class will be. So... Um, that's all everybody. Thank you so much. Shoot me an email if you have any questions and, uh, I'm looking forward to a great quarter.